Welcome to Loud and Clear, a podcast dedicated to amplifying the voices of women in music. I'm your host, Olivia Adams, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Kate Nishimura. Kate Nishimura is a Japanese-Canadian composer based in Waterloo, Ontario. Known for her writing, nature-inspired, programmatic music, Kate has established herself as a prominent voice in the concert band community. Kate's music has been presented at the Midwest Clinic, Music Fest Canada, and numerous other international conferences and festivals. Her work has become increasingly popular among educational music programs and within the professional new music scene, with new works being regularly commissioned and performed by ensembles and individuals around the world. Kate is committed to creating contemporary music that is approachable, relevant, and enjoyable for all. Before transitioning to a full-time career as a composer, she taught instrumental music and continues to prioritize and advocate for the value of music education. She actively seeks opportunities to connect personally with the communities for whom she writes, and she is passionate about empowering others through art. She strives to set a positive example for future generations of musicians, especially those from historically underrepresented groups, through her creative work and her dedication to mental health awareness. As a lifelong environmentalist, she not only draws inspiration from the natural world, but also uses her platform to advocate for conservation awareness and action. Kate was the winner of the Canadian Band Association's Composition Prize in 2017 and is an associate composer of the Canadian Music Centre. She holds degrees in music education from the University of Toronto but is an advocate for people pursuing their passions regardless of their field of study. Welcome, Kate. I'm so excited to talk with you today. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. We met, I think, a year ago, maybe, online. Yeah. Um, I played a piece of your music and I tagged you in it. And then it started this conversation and this back and forth. And I've really enjoyed getting to know your music more and uh, also being able to follow you online and now have a conversation. So before we get into chatting about your life as a composer and your music, I was wondering if you could tell our audience just a little bit more about yourself and what led you down the path of wanting to become a musician. Yeah, so um, it's it's actually hard to kind of trace it back to a singular moment in time or anything like that. But uh, there was always music around when I was growing up as a kid. So I'm the only formal musician in my family, but my parents always had music playing on the radio and we went to family shows, you know, uh, symphony shows that are geared towards children and family audiences. Like we we did those kinds of things when I was growing up. So even though it wasn't like I had other musicians in the family or anything, there there was a lot of music appreciation that was happening around me, like right from the beginning. Um, so when I expressed interest and showed a little bit of curiosity into different instruments and um, just the arts in general. I was also interested in dance and theater and other things. Um, I was met with support, which was great. So I, yeah, I started um, like singing and kind of making my own music in an informal way before I ever had any formal music instruction. And I know we'll get more into the composition side of things later, but I think that they started around the same time, to be honest. I think there was never a a split of, you know, musician or composer. It was, I'm interested in communicating through sound. Like I was so just in love with the storytelling aspect of the music that I was listening to. And so I remember wanting to do that too, like wanting to tell stories through music. I didn't necessarily know that it was called being a composer, or I didn't know if there was a specific instrument that I wanted to play or anything like that. But I just was really fascinated by the whole world of music, I guess, from from early childhood. I love that. I just liked how you said I was interested in communicating with sound, like yeah. through music. I think that's so great. And the storytelling aspects of it, because yeah, I mean, I, there's always that something that draws us in. And it's interesting that you say that, I mean, the more and more people that I've been interviewing, the more I hear, it was never that I specifically, oh, I'm going to now choose the path of becoming a musician. It was just sort of part of the family life. Like music was just there. Yeah. And so it felt like this sort of natural evolution. I love that. So what was it that led you down the path of then becoming a composer as a as a means of income? And then how did you know, I guess, how to make that step into it becoming your full-time job? Yeah, so I'll try to summarize the journey here because so really my music education started 
in a more formal way when I started playing in the concert band in elementary school. Um, so that happened before I started taking private lessons on, I, I play the bass clarinet in concert band, um, but I didn't take private lessons. The education that I got at school was what I got. I took piano lessons for a couple years around that same age, like around age 10 or so. And so I had a little bit of foundation of musical skills and and literacy and things like that when I started in band. But yeah, so I, I really loved playing in all of the ensembles that I had the opportunity to join. When I went to high school, there was even more uh, ensembles. So I started learning new instruments so that I could join other ensembles. And, um, you know, they didn't have a bass clarinet in the jazz band. So I started learning the saxophone so I could play in the jazz band. And I started learning the bassoon so I could play in the orchestra. And I you know, sang so that I could be in the choir. Like, I just really loved being immersed in these different musical communities. And I think that my interest in composition kind of came from being exposed to so many different types of music in all of these different ensembles. And I was doing a bit of songwriting, again, just in an informal way, like in my bedroom as a teenager, writing songs about things I would never share with anyone publicly, right? Like, just almost like a musical diary. Like, it was it was my... Uh, emotional outlet, creative outlet, and form of expression right from the beginning. And I never imagined creating a career out of that. It was just something that I did because I felt comfortable expressing myself in that way. I was a very quiet kid, very shy, nervous child. And I'm not so much like that now, but I think music was really important for me at that time of my life um, to kind of give me that that outlet and form of connecting with people. So I started taking some of the concepts that I was doing with my songwriting and wondering if I could apply that to all these different instrumentations that I was a part of in all of these ensembles in high school. Like, what if I could write a song, but for the wind ensemble, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, again, never with any specific goals, like I'm going to be a famous composer. And I'm gonna, like, I never even really thought of that. <laughs> it was really just, wow, my friends are really good at their instruments. I'm going to write something for them to play, like for all of us to play together. I wrote my first piece that I wrote for band was for the band that I was a part of. And so it was always very, like, I was so closely connected with that because it was my friends, it was my teacher who conducted, it was my school, right? And I think from there, I don't know, I mean, it still took several years for me to realize that being a composer was actually a viable career path. I think part of the reason for that is, you know, some societal stigmas around like the starving artist mentality that, you know, this is not a way to make money and composers are dead people that we play their music for years and years and years. Like, I, I just, I didn't have a lot of modeling of like living composers. We didn't, this was a different time. I think now there's a lot of spotlight on living composers and composers from diverse backgrounds and things like that. But at the time when I was a student, that wasn't so much of a focus. <laughs> uh, and so I didn't play music that was written by somebody who looked like me, somebody that had a name like mine. I didn't play music that was written by women. I didn't play music that was written by even just like living composers at all was, was kind of rare. So it, it took some, you know, time to wrap my head around the idea that just because I didn't see someone like me doing something didn't mean that I couldn't do it. But anyway, I had convinced myself that becoming a music educator um, was a a safer path, <laughs> um, but also one that I was passionate about. I had a really positive experience in my own musical education, you know, most of it coming from being at school and playing in all these ensembles. So I thought, well, maybe I could be part of that for other people. If I become a teacher, then I can influence the next generation of musicians. And, you know, like I really had that in my mind that that was a good idea. And long story short, I, I did complete my degree in music education. I went to teacher's college. I taught for a few years and I really did love it. But at, at the end of it all, uh, I decided to see if I could make it as a full-time composer. And that was five years ago. <laughs> so... I'm five years into my career now as a composer, and I still see myself as an educator first. I think that the music that I write is 
with students in mind and with teachers in mind. I know what it's like to be in those chairs within the ensemble. I know what it's like to be up on the podium as an educator. I know what it's like to be in the audience as an audience member of new music and old music. You know, I I have the perspective, I think, of everybody involved in the musical ecosystem. And so I feel that the music that I write is possible because of that perspective and those experiences that I have. So being a composer is just a creative way of making an impact in the music education world through a slightly different platform than being in in the same classroom day after day. I'm able to reach a, a larger community through my music and I enjoy doing, you know, guest artist visits with schools and Zoom calls with bands all around the world that are playing my music. Like that the education side of things is still very important to me. And I do my best to still stay true to that in what I do. But yeah, so I, I mean, again, there wasn't like a singular moment or anything when I knew this is something that I could do as a career. Um, I just, I took a, a chance and uh, yeah. I knew it was something that I loved and had, had always loved. And I got some good advice uh, from other composers that wished that they had taken that leap sooner so that they could have spent more of their lives focusing on writing music for others. And so here we are. <laughs> that is amazing. I love hearing every musician's just unique journey to mm-hmm. kind of where they are. Some people start in a totally different career path. Yeah. And some people don't pursue it as a career, but more as their, you know, their vocation. Passion. The pleasure that yeah, they yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, I'm I'm really glad for one that uh, as a musician, I'm so glad that you took the leap to do composing full time because <laughs> you have written some absolutely incredible works. And thank you. I, for one, really enjoy your music. And I know so many other musicians that enjoy your music as well. So I think we're all glad that you you took the, <laughs> that leap of faith there. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. It was tough at times, especially at first, yeah. but I'm happy with the decision too. That's great. So, so much of your music is derived from this sort of natural imagery. And I wonder if you could share more about your experience doing forest therapy and if that influences your composition style. I imagine it must. Yeah, that's a great question. So just a tiny bit of background on forest therapy, if there's anyone out there that doesn't know what this is. So forest bathing uh, is another way of referring to this. And the practice in Japan, which is where it originated, is called Shinrin Yoku, um, which is its rough translation is forest bathing or taking in the forest atmosphere. And so forest therapy is a form of mindfulness and nature connection that is focused on experiencing nature through all of our senses. So a forest therapy guide may invite a group of participants on a walk that is a very slow walk. It's different from a naturalist, you know, walk where you're identifying things. It's different from uh, a hike that is for the purpose of exercise. This is a, a slow, mindful walking experience. And the guide will offer prompts or invitations for people to connect with various things in the landscape using all of their senses. So what do you hear? What do you see? Maybe things that you can actually touch with your hands, the different scents that might occur at different times of the year in a particular spot. And there are so many benefits um, to participating in forest therapy from reduced blood pressure and lowered stress, improved quality of sleep, a boost in creativity and focus. Like it just goes on and on and on. And we all know by now that, you know, spending time outdoors is a good thing just across the board. But some people maybe need a little bit of support in connecting with nature, not just being outside in a passive way, but actually deepening that connection with your surroundings. So that's where I come in. So I finished my certification last year um, in forest therapy. So I'm, I'm now able to offer this practice to other people. And I'm really excited to do more of that work because it's something that I've been doing on my own as part of my own just personal practice in, you know, managing my own mental health and physical health. And my relationship with nature is, I think, the most important relationship that I've had in my life over the course of my life. And so it's no surprise that that kind of seeps its way into my creative work as well. So I definitely think that my experience with forest therapy and just being connected to nature deeply influences 
my musicianship and my approach to composing. Aside from just my music being inspired by nature, because that that's a maybe more obvious level of, you know, I visit a beautiful place and then maybe I write music inspired by this place, by the, the, the landscapes, the mountains, the sun, the, you know, all the various aspects that we might notice about nature. I write lots of music that is kind of inspired by those experiences. But I also think that the mindfulness component of forest therapy has impacted my process because it helps me kind of zoom out and see the bigger picture. Um, so sometimes when you're caught up in a project, it's it's hard to see the bigger picture. There's a lot of stress with deadlines and pressure and expectations and meeting the parameters that somebody else has set and, you know, all this stuff. Having the, the mental space and clarity, I think that's something that forest therapy really helps, you know, with that for me, being able to slow down and notice the signs that my body is giving me if I need to take a break, if I need to put more energy into a particular aspect of my work. I mean, I could go on and on about the impacts of of nature connection on creativity and all of that. But certainly for me, it's I don't think I could have one without the other. I think that they just kind of go together for me. Right. Yeah. And so it's just almost this sort of natural byproduct of your connection with nature that it started to, it shows up in your music in, in so many ways, be it really obvious or, or more subtle. Yeah. I mean, I, I love just taking melodies from bird song, for example, or like I just finished a piece that was all about the movement of wind and how the wind dances with the plants or the way that it moves across a body of water, the way that it might hit up against a rock face. And like, I was thinking about how could I create music that would represent the way the wind you know, maneuvers through a space. Those are the kinds of things that I've been thinking about forever. Like since I was a kid, I wanted to write music that told the stories of animals and things like that. But I think, you know, deepening that nature connection as an adult definitely has um, translated into my creative work too. That's so interesting. That's really cool. You touched on it slightly and I wonder if we could like dive into it a little bit more. What does the composition process look like for you? Does it always start on a particular instrument or I like to call it like the seed to stage process, <laughs> yeah. right? Like the, the seed of an idea to a full performance. What does that look like for, for you? Yeah. So it's a little different each time depending on the project and who's involved and all these things. But generally speaking, I will start outside <laughs> and go for a big long walk or several big long walks and really think through my ideas and allow my ideas to flow and connect and kind of just see where I'm at when I come back inside. So I think essentially what I'm saying is it starts with a period of brainstorming and I don't really begin with the music. I begin with, is there a concept that I'm trying to convey? Is there a narrative, maybe a, a place that I want to focus on and represent? You know, those kinds of things. And I have a hard time coming up with ideas when I'm just sitting in one spot. I find that my ideas flow a lot better when I'm in motion. So mm -hmm. that's why I take the big long walks. But then when I'm ready to do the music making, I usually start at the piano. Mm -hmm. And the piano is not my primary instrument you know, when I was in school and I was performing, but I find it to be my favorite compositional tool because I can essentially accompany myself as I'm working through ideas. So I use my own voice a lot to sing through melodies and I'm quite comfortable at the piano just playing chords or, you know, trying different voicings of things like as I'm orchestrating something, even if the piano isn't going to be in the final product at all, I find it helpful as a tool just to make sense of the ideas that I'm working with. And my process also involves recording those improv brainstorm sessions at the beginning. I find that a lot of beginner composers or songwriters struggle with this pressure to write down your ideas before you forget them. <laughs> uh, and my solution to that is just record on my phone or my computer or whatever so that I can go back to it later if there's something that I liked and I can worry about writing it down then. It allows me to just stay in the moment when I'm kind of generating the ideas and feeling it out. And then from there, I move to my computer and I start inputting my ideas into music notation software and making all the decisions like which instruments will get which parts and which moments in the piece are going to be the peak. You know, it's a lot of kind of rearranging pieces of the puzzle. Right. Um, 
And one thing that I've started to do lately is actually using sticky notes or, or like pieces of paper to create these sections of the piece and then move them around in different orders to see if, well, maybe this section that I thought was going to happen at the end could actually start the whole thing. How would it change the experience of the piece if I reordered things around? So in other words, I never write a piece start to finish all in yeah. one go. <laughs> it's a lot of like jumping around and um, the process is very messy until it isn't, you know, like it's, it's messy up until the point where here's a piece. Somehow it it all exists all together. And I agonize over titles, over decisions like, oh, maybe it would be better in the trumpets. Oh, maybe better in the trombones. I mean, like I, I move things around all the time. And eventually when I'm happy with something um, or when my deadline approaches or whichever <laughs> comes first, <laughs> um, you know, then I'll call it done and generate the score and parts, distribute those to the appropriate people. I like to, especially when it's a commission, I like to stay really connected with the people that I'm writing for and get their input, get their feedback. Sometimes I have to make small changes to the piece once they've started playing it and they realize, you know, maybe a balance thing or maybe they don't have this particular instrument or something like that. And then ideally I get to attend the premiere, or I get to attend a performance or I get to hear a recording or something like that. But that's that's essentially the, the seed to stage, I suppose, of the whole thing. I find it interesting that you use the sticky notes. I do the same thing when I'm writing. If mm. I'm writing an article or something, I move things around on the floor just with yeah. my like cue cards. <laughs> yep. What would it be like if I started this section here? So exactly. Like composers are using that. It kind of reminds me of like in um, film directors and things like mm. that too. Like we'll move like for storyboard yeah. stuff, we'll we'll move their ideas around. And yeah, I mean, I, I think people have the idea that when you're writing music, you're just writing music. But I think there's a lot of other processes that go into it. And, you know, it's not all that different from writing an article, or writing an essay or writing a novel. Like you kind of, you have to decide how do you want to communicate with your audience with your readers, with, you know, mm -hmm. substitute whichever is appropriate, right? But I, I think the process is similar. Starting with point form and then going to full paragraphs is like starting with a seed of a musical idea, a couple of notes that you like, and then somehow that turns into an entire piece of music. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I like how you said it's messy until it isn't. Yeah. Because you're right. And even when I'm teaching composition to my students, you know, uh -huh. as part of our theory practice, as like, it's just good for them to, to be composing and be creative. They want it to, they want to just start writing something down. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 we're, we're going to improvise. We're going to yeah. play around. Like we're not writing anything down for the first couple of weeks so that we can just be creative. And I would yeah. I just tell them the same thing as rec record it on their phones or yeah. an iPad or something because we have this idea of like composers sit down at their computers and they just start writing things and it's yeah that is very much not how it is yeah. <laughs> at least with the composer friends that I've talked with <laughs> for sure yeah <laughs> what do you consider the most challenging part of your compositional process and then what's the most enjoyable part for you hmm okay so I think the most challenging there's a lot that's challenging and there's a lot that's rewarding so it's hard to choose just one but I, I think for me the kind of final stages of the creative process are really difficult for me because um, it's a lot of fun to come up with new ideas. It's a lot of fun to play around with orchestration. And like we talked about moving the pieces all over the place and seeing what might work like that stuff is exploratory. I get to follow my curiosity and have a lot of fun with that. But I think the final stages of having to make the decision that it's done, <laughs> that's really tough for me. And I do experience these big waves of self doubt, even as someone who has found a moderate amount of success in this world, like I still question if I know what I'm doing or if people are going to connect with what I've created or like, should I just scrap the whole thing and start over? All all this stuff, it's, I guess, internal conflict that happens right at, towards the finish line of a project, right? I feel that that is the most challenging to overcome. And then ultimately, on the other side of that, when the music is in the real world, real human beings are playing the piece, that brings me a lot of fulfillment just to know that 
my music is being brought to life in classrooms, in practice rooms, on stage, in, you know, wherever music happens. It's really special for me to know that people are interacting with music that started out as just ideas that I had on my own individually, right? And that now that's something that can be shared with other people. So I, I think maybe that's the most enjoyable part is, is getting to experience the music in the real world and connect with the people who are bringing it to life. That's why I mentioned earlier, I love doing the you know Zoom calls with a band that's playing my music, or if I have the chance to visit in person and attend a performance, it's really rewarding. It kind of completes that full circle kind of thing, because otherwise it's like, you know, I'm birthing a new work into the yeah. world and then just sending it off on its own. Like if I don't, if I don't get that satisfaction of seeing what happens to the work, I think over time that that starts to kind of wear on you. So having the opportunity to connect once the piece is finished, I think is, is important to me. Absolutely. Yeah. I always encourage any musicians that I'm working with, if you were playing a composition by a living composer, send them a video. Yeah. Send them a like, you know, just a record a recording, even if it's just from your phone, mm -hmm. you know, and you're not in your practice room and it doesn't need to be from a stage. But I always tell my students, I said, like composers want to know that you connected with their music. That matters yeah. to them. I've Absolutely. never ever had a composer not care like, about no, that. Yeah. Don't play my music, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And oftentimes the students, you know, they'll feel like self-conscious or they oh, it needs to be perfect. And I'm like, no, they want to know that somebody is out there enjoying. And I would imagine for you because you write for concert bands and choirs and like larger ensembles that you do solo and smaller ensembles mm. as well. But the majority of your work is bands, right? Yeah. And so then to be able to hear it with all of those instruments, it must be like yeah. such a rewarding experience. And to feel it. I mean, you can't like being in a room with that many instruments, right? Whether it's an orchestra, a band, a choir, like it really is a tangible experience. Like you can feel that uh, sound in the room, right? And all the energy that has to go into that. So yeah, that's definitely the best part. And absolutely to what you said about students and musicians of any level, like definitely tell composers that you're playing their music. Like even if you don't have a good recording, even if you don't have a performance or a concert program you can share or something like that, it totally makes my day to get a message from someone on Instagram or an email, whatever. Someone saying like, hey, I just started working on your piece and I'm really enjoying it. Just wanted to let you know, or I'm programming your piece on my recital on whatever day like that stuff is really meaningful to me and I think I speak on behalf of all living composers you know sure. we we really do love to hear from people even if we're not able to make it to every performance or we're not able to actually have a conversation with every person those messages do really make an impact yeah I love that <laughs> do you have any encouragement for new composers who are starting to develop their own compositional voice and advice for just how to keep going how to start to find your sound as a composer yeah. So this is a good question. I would say that in general, my advice is to just focus on getting as much musical experience as you can. And it doesn't all have to be within the same thing. Like, I think, unfortunately, institutional music kind of forces us into these streams, right? Like, are you a performance major? Are you a composition major? Are you a teacher? Like, there's, it's like it creates this divide among the community. Yeah. And in reality, most jobs, Jobs, most musical creative jobs involve doing a lot of different things and being well-rounded. And so I think for anyone who's considering going down that path um, with composition or otherwise just within music, being a well-rounded musician is important. Developing a lot of different musical skills is going to work in your favor when it comes time to, whether it's auditioning for a music school or if you've already done that and you're wanting to build a career or you're already in a career and you want to change course, whatever it is, having a, a variety of musical skills and you know, a wide breadth of musical experiences, I think is going to be important. So that's just kind of general advice, but for composers specifically trying to, you know, develop your voice and, and find your style and things like that, I think just don't be afraid to try things. Don't be afraid to change course. Like maybe you write a song that is in one style and then you want to write something that is completely different. Like don't focus on creating a catalog right away. You know, don't focus on, I'm going to write an album of songs and they're all going to be in this style style this genre or yeah I just I think developing that kind of variety is is important because that's how you find your voice is by trying different 
things. And even on an instrument, right, you kind of overcorrect. Like what happens if I play really loud? What happens if I play way too soft? Then you find the sweet spot in the middle. So compositionally, try a bunch of stuff. Try writing something, you know, that's really happy. Try some writing something that's dark and heavy, even if that's uncharacteristic of, of yourself. Try writing in different genres, different styles, different, just change it up as much as possible, because I think that's how you test the waters. And unless you're a professional and someone has given you specific instructions, like you're to write for these instruments, this long of a piece that, you know, unless someone's given you those parameters, you are free to explore and experiment and follow your curiosity. So my advice is just to do that. And I really feel that that's how people find their voice is just by trying. I think that's great advice because how are you supposed to find your voice if you're only trying to do one thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm curious, Kate, what are you enjoying in your musical life right now? That's a good question. So I lately have been really reflecting on my relationship with music overall, because as I'm sure you can relate and lots of listeners may be able to relate to, um, when you take something that you love as a hobby or just as something that you do for enjoyment and then you make that your job Mm -hmm. your relationship with that thing drastically shifts not necessarily in a bad way but just it, it shifts right and for me as I mentioned composing was something that I just did for myself because I loved it it was a form of expression all these different things when I made composing my job that changed how I felt about the act of writing music And for the past five years, I've exclusively been writing music for other people in the form of commissions. And I am very, very fortunate to be in a position where people are paying me to write music for them. I'm so grateful for that. Truly, it's the dream job. (laughs) But I want to remember what it feels like to write music just for myself. Mm -hmm. And so... I think what I'm enjoying in my musical life right now is carving out some time for myself to just make the music that I feel called to make and write songs, again, in an informal way that communicate what I have to say. And I've really been enjoying listening to music by other living artists and immersing myself in the world of new music that I didn't make myself, you know, like I spent as a composer, I spent so much time working on my own music. So I think lately, I've just been trying to take a step back from that and reconnect with being a music lover and being an audience member and being a hobbyist musician. Like what are the aspects of music that I do just for fun? I know people listening can't see this, but I behind me, I have a a banjo and a ukulele like those are instruments that are not part of my composer career they're instruments that I play because they're fun to play so I think that's kind of where I'm at these days is just trying to reconnect with some of that fun um, that I not lost entirely but things shifted when I made this my career absolutely I think that's so important when you're in a creative stream as a job to be able to still connect with the creativity in a way that that serves you from what I'm hearing you say is it's a method of self-care as well yeah definitely yeah because I mean I remember times in my life when I was a student and not a musician as a professional just Mm -hmm. like I band was my favorite class at school right and I would go home from a stressful day of school or I worked part-time jobs when I was a student and I would go home and play my guitar in my bedroom and I kind of want to remember what that feels like and I think it's important not just for musicians but yeah, like you said, anyone in a creative field, finding creative outlets that are just for you, that are just for fun, and that are not tied to monetary things, that are not tied to external expectations, that are just bringing you back to why you fell in love with it in the first place. Absolutely. I ended up marrying my chamber music partner. Oh, <laughs> amazing. <university. laughs> Yeah. And we had this older mentor couple who also they they met when they were young and they had they were married and they also were each other's musical partners yeah. as well. And the advice that they gave us was keep some music that's just for you. Mm, it's not yeah. part of your career. It's not part of what you're doing as your job, but it's just yours to share. Yeah, I love and that. They're like still find time to like just have fun 
making music with each other because we, you know, we both ended up going into music as career path. And so I think that's the a very similar advice is, is just keep some, just keep some that's for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Well, before we wrap up with some rapid fire questions, I also wanted to touch on the fact that you are also a podcaster and you have an incredible podcast. And I wonder if you could just share that with our audience and, and what you guys do over on your podcast. Yeah. So I co-host a podcast called The Band Room Podcast with my friend and collaborator Dylan Maddox. And Dylan is a conductor, music educator. I, of course, am a composer and also with the education side of things and all the other stuff that we both do. So I think it's it's really interesting bringing both of our perspectives to the podcast. Um, We interview people that are in some way connected to the band world or the music education world. So lots of composers, lots of conductors and band directors, music educators at all levels, people with performing careers. We try to offer something for everybody, hopefully in our in our listener community. But yeah, we really enjoy it. And it's very fulfilling. I'm sure you can relate like it's we're doing this to to kind of provide a platform for other people to share their stories and perspectives. But also we as hosts get to have really inspiring conversations with people on the regular. So (laughs) I think, um, yeah, it's it's an aspect of my life right now that I'm enjoying a lot. And I love asking questions. So it's a lot of fun to be a podcast host to get to prompt other people to share things. And yeah, I enjoy it a lot. Thanks for asking. And if anyone wants to check it out, bandroompod.com and all the, you know, the usual podcast listening options, it's it's there. Yeah. And I'll have all the links in the show notes and everything awesome. for that. That's great. And I totally agree with you. It is getting paid to talk to people about music and ask them about their musical lives. It's like, I really get to do this for my job. Yeah. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> so much fun. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's just been an absolute pleasure getting to talk with you, Kate. We're going to wrap up our chat with a few rapid fire questions. So no wrong answers. Just go with your gut. I've been asking okay. every guest the same five questions this season and I'll shake them okay. up next season. But can you point to a moment when you knew you wanted to be a musician? Well, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, but there isn't really a moment, but I'll Just off the top of my head, I remember listening to Peter and the Wolf when I was a kid and I just was obsessed with making the connection between like a particular instrument and then a particular animal and how that kind of worked together. I just was really fascinated by that and I don't know that that specific moment made me become a musician, but it definitely kind of piqued my curiosity and then I think I leaned into that interest a little bit more and you know, wanted to see if I could do that too. I love that. I yeah. also remember listening to Peter and the Wolf when I was yeah. a kid. I like took this extra credit music course and I could like take, I had to check the CDs out of like the homeroom library and I'd like go to the music room and put them in the CD <laughs> player and like fill out my little sheets. Yeah, <laughs> so fun. I love it. Do you have a favorite piece or song to perform play through currently? What's a current favorite? That's a tough one. Well, okay. Again, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, it's not not really current, but I always loved performing this piece called The Hounds of Spring by Alfred Reed when I was in band. It was just always a really fulfilling and enjoyable and engaging piece to play. There was kind of something in it for everyone. I felt like there was a lot of moments where maybe I wasn't the most important thing happening in the ensemble, but I knew who was and it was my mm-hmm. friends and I would listen to them. Like, I think it was just a piece that stood out to me as like everyone was kind of amped up to play it and that and that was really fun for me and still to this day I enjoy listening to performances of that piece and listening to recordings too so it just one that kind of stuck with me after all these years I love that have you ever been given bad career advice <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. Um, well, yes, I have been told in the past that, you know, you need to study something in order to build a career in it. I am a living example of that not being true because, I mean, we obviously I, I have musical training in lots of ways, but I've never formally studied composition and yet... I have a career as a composer. So I think just the idea that you have to do something in a specific order in order to do it, I think that's just bad advice all around because everybody, as we've talked about, everyone has like a unique path to get to where they are. And I don't think that there's any one singular way to do something, to find success, to find fulfillment, you know? So I think just, yeah, I've been given bad advice in general with just the idea that you have to do something one way or you can't do it at all. That's that. (laughs) 
on the flip side, what is some good music or career advice that you could pass on to other musicians? I think um, stay connected with music as much as you can over your life, whether it becomes a career or not. If there was a spark at any time in your life from the music world, from the realm of music, stick with that in some way. And maybe that means becoming a patron of a local orchestra or theater or opera, or maybe it means going to your open mics that happen every week and supporting local songwriters or whatever it is. Like, even if you're not the one making the music, I think if you've been involved with music, you understand the magic of it and you understand the power of being in this world and connecting with other people who appreciate it. So I know this maybe is a little bit different from what you maybe had in mind. This isn't not even what I thought I would say um, in terms of advice for musicians, because I think a lot of people, if you're already a musician, maybe this doesn't apply, but just so many people think that you have to leave something behind if it doesn't become your profession. And a lot of people take private music lessons all throughout their childhood and adolescence, and then they just completely abruptly stop because they go into engineering or they go, you know, and to me, I think there's just there's no reason not to continue doing something that you loved, even if it's not something that you do for a living. Absolutely. I currently am teaching a, an adult piano student who is an engineer and <laughs> had always wanted to play the piano, but yeah. their family couldn't afford it yeah. growing up. And they said, like, once I have a career, I'm going to start playing the piano. And like, even in university, they went and got a little toy keyboard. Oh. And advanced. Now they have a lovely piano yeah. and I'm, you know, and they've got kids and I teach the kids, but they get to pursue that dream of being a musician. Oh, that's awesome. You know? And it's, it's a huge part of their life, even though it's not something that they're going to make money at. Yeah. And I think I will off offer advice for people who do want to make money at it too, because I think that's important. Um, still finding a way to to just be who you are, right? So there's a lot of pressure to change parts of ourselves to accommodate the expectations of others. And you get this a lot in the pop music industry where somebody is told by management or whatever that you have to change the way your songs sound or you have to change your image to kind of fit within <laughs> what people think it should be. And in classical music, there's it's there's just so much pressure from every direction. And I think remembering why you got involved in music in the first place and carrying that with you as you go forward, I think that's helped me and I hope it will help other people. So yeah, just remembering to kind of be, it sounds cliche, like to be yourself, but to remember why you connected with music and bring that with you as you, as you work. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. I mean, especially in classical music, there's a lot of pressure to conform to a certain model. We even, yeah. we do it in the way that we dress, we do it in the way that we sound, you know, because we're, we're talking yeah. about blend all the time, that it's really easy to sort of become a chameleon. Totally. Um, and I think that's really important to stay true to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. What are you listening to right now? So lately I've been listening to a lot of bluegrass music, which is not something that I had really explored very much until recently, until I started playing the banjo and I wanted to listen to other styles and learn more about that. So lately I've been listening to an artist called Molly Tuttle. Um, she is a bluegrass artist and songwriter and her songs tell really interesting stories which now that you've talked to me for an hour, you know, that's my, that's my <laughs> thing. I love storytelling. Yeah. So I've really loved getting to know new musical artists like that. And my favorite song by her right now is called Crooked Tree. And it's about uh, living life kind of differently and, and embracing that. I love that. That's yeah. so great. I'm going to link that in the show notes. I'll be sure. Awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Do you mind letting our audience know where they can find you just so that people who are listening, they can look you up online and, and follow the work that you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Um. So my website is katenishimura.com and you can find my recordings and program notes and info about things there. On social media, my handle is composer Kate and Kate is spelled C-A-I-T. So if you look it up with the wrong spelling, you might not find me. So <laughs> com composer Kate on all the social things. And yeah, I love to hear from people and I look forward to hopefully getting connected with some community members from here. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciated talking with you. Thank you for the invitation. I liked it.
And a big thank you to Kate for being on the podcast. I so enjoyed that conversation. I was really looking forward to chatting with her after connecting online for the last year. So if you are a concert band instructor at any level, I strongly encourage you to check out her podcast as well as check out the amazing compositions that she has for sale on her website. She also has music for choirs. She has music for soloists and groups like brass ensembles. So there's a little bit of something for every musician there and I really encourage you to check it out because her music is amazing. Thank you so much for tuning into the podcast this week. I always enjoy creating this show for you so please show this show some love by giving it a five-star rating or a written review on Apple Podcasts. Even if that's not the platform you listen to, it really does help get our show in front of other audiences. It helps boost our ratings which helps to get us more listeners so that I can keep making this show for you. Thank you to the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra for sponsoring this podcast. Please go and check out their work via concertstream.tv or on saskatoonsymphony.org. My name is Olivia Adams. I'm OA Music Studios on socials and I look forward to talking with you next week. Take care.